When I first started using lambda functions, I made a terrible mistake in my function code because I did not understand how lambda lifecycle works. I used an instance variable in my function code, assuming it will be reset in my constructor code. Only that it didn't. In this video, let's understand the lambda lifecycle, learn the different phases, and see how it affects the code that you write in your function. Hello everyone. My name is Rahul and welcome back to this YouTube channel. If you're new here, I make videos on .NET, Azure, AWS, and DevOps. This video is sponsored by AWS and is part of my .NET on AWS series. Without much delay, let's dive right into learning about Lambda lifecycle. The Lambda lifecycle consists of three phases, the init phase, the invoke phase, and then the shutdown phase. Each of these phases has different tasks and responsibilities that the Lambda runtime does for us. Let's get into the details of these. In the init phase, the Lambda performs these three tasks. It starts all the extensions, it bootstraps the runtime, and it also runs the function's static code. The init phase is also limited to 10 seconds, and if it doesn't complete within that 10 seconds, Lambda retries the init phase at the time of the first function invocation. This is when you're actually calling your function code by invoking it from some triggers. Now the restore phase is for Lambda snap start only, which is right now available only with Java programming language. So I will not be diving into that right now. The invoke phase is when a Lambda function is invoked. This is actually when we are calling the Lambda function by using one of the triggers. Now this could be using an HTTP API or using SQS, SNS or a manual trigger on the Lambda function. Now these have a duration based on the timeout that you have set on your Lambda function. For example, if you have 360 seconds as the function's timeout, then the invoke phase will wait for 360 seconds before responding back. Now the function code and all the extensions needs to complete within this 360 seconds. Now during the execution of the function, if the Lambda function crashes or times out, the Lambda resets the execution environment. Now this is very similar to the shutdown event, which we will see a moment later. Now as you can see, in a normal invoke phase, all it does is invoke the function code. However, if it's a case in invoke with an error, it resets the runtime and it also does the extension shutdown. So the next time an invoke is made to the same Lambda, it makes sure to initializes the extension and the runtime before calling the function initialization and invoking the actual function code. Finally, it will again follow the shutdown phase. Now the shutdown phase is called when the Lambda is about to shut down the runtime. This is usually after a period of inactivity on the Lambda instance, and usually averages around 20 to 30 minutes. So if your Lambda function is not being used for a long time, it will invoke the shutdown phase. Even after shutdown, the Lambda maintains the execution environment for some time in anticipation of another function invocation. And if that happens, it will reuse the same instance. Now, when writing your function code, do not assume that Lambda automatically reuses the execution environment. So let's look at how the Lambda lifecycle affects the code you're writing and some of the practices that you can follow when writing your function code. Let's switch to Visual Studio because I will be showing this in a .NET Lambda function code example. So here I have Visual Studio open. So let's create a new project and create an empty Lambda project. Now, since I have installed the AWS toolkit, I have all the Lambda and associated AWS templates already on my Visual Studio. So let me select the AWS Lambda project .NET Core and click Next. Now let's give this a name. So let's name this as Lambda Lifecycle and let's make sure this is in the appropriate folder and click Create. Now this prompts you to select the blueprint for your Lambda function. In this case, I will choose empty function. If you're completely new to AWS Lambda, I highly recommend checking out my getting started with Lambda functions on this YouTube channel. I also have a Udemy course, which walks through the beginner scenarios on building Lambda functions and using it in a real world application. So let's click finish, which will create a new AWS Lambda function using C-sharp and .NET. 
So we have the project set up. Here on the left, we can see there is a function.cs and the AWS Lambda tools defaults.json. So let's navigate into the function.cs, which has our function code. Now this is the function handler that's going to get invoked when we are going to deploy this function. Now all this does now is take in a string input and converts it into uppercase. So let's create a constructor inside here. Let's also add a new property. Let's keep this as type int and call this count. Now inside the function constructor, I'm going to set this count as zero. Now inside my function handler, I'm simply going to increment the count. So let's say count plus plus, and let's use this inside the return value. So instead of simply returning the input, let's also return the input and the count together. So let's use string interpolation. So let's specify the input and let's specify the count as well. So let's specify count and return this. Now all this function handler does is take in a string input and it interpolates and returns the input along with the count which is getting incremented. Now the mistake that I made was assuming that this function code will reset the count all the time to be zero. Now my function code was doing much more than just incrementing the count, but you get the idea. Now let's run this by deploying to AWS Lambda. To do that, let me right click on the project and choose publish to AWS Lambda. Now this option is available here because of AWS Toolkit. It is also connected to my AWS account so that I can directly deploy it from Visual Studio. Now, if you're new to setting this up, I highly recommend checking out my AWS credentials video, which will be linked here and also in the descriptions below. Now with that set up, let's give this a function name. So let's call this as Lambda dash lifecycle and click next. This has the runtime as .NET 6 as expected. Let's select the role name. So in this case, all I need is a basic Lambda execution access. So let's select AWS Lambda basic execution role. This gives access to execute the function and also write to CloudWatch. So let's click upload, which uploads the function into my AWS account. The Lambda function is successfully deployed. So if I navigate to my AWS console and go to the Lambda section, I can see the Lambda function in here. So we have the Lambda dash lifecycle successfully deployed here. So let's come back to Visual Studio and invoke this particular Lambda. So let's give the input here. So let's specify as Visual Studio and let's click invoke. Now this invokes the Lambda and returns back the response. As you can see, it responds back with Visual Studio dash one, just what we expected. But let's invoke this again and this time it's returning Visual Studio 2. So our count property was not reset from the constructor code. So if we come back to the function.cs, I had reset this count to zero inside my functions constructor. However, the function handler, all it does is increment the count and return that back. So every time the Lambda function is getting invoked, all it's doing is just invoking the function handler. So if I come back and invoke this again, you can see this is Visual Studio 3. Now, if we come to the Lambda lifecycle images, you can see that the constructor code is only getting invoked using the function initialization. Every time we invoke the function, only that class function is getting invoked and not the constructor. So it's actually using the same instance of the class to call all the functions. Now, if I come back again and make another invoke, it's still returning Visual Studio 4. Now this gets reset only when Lambda shuts down that specific instance. Now this happens when there is a period of inactivity and usually lasts for 20 to 30 minutes. It also happens when we deploy a new instance of the code onto our Lambda function. So if I was to simply right click and say publish to Lambda again and deploy this all over once more. So let's click upload without any changes but still the Lambda function package has changed. Now in this case, if I invoke this again, the count has now reset. So you can see this is now again Visual Studio 1. This is because we just deployed a new instance of the Lambda function to the Lambda instance. Now let's click invoke again and it follows the same practice. Now since we are sequentially calling the invoke function, it is using the same Lambda instance. But what if there is a spike of request to our Lambda call? 
So let's say this is an API and there's hundreds of requests coming into this API. In this case, Lambda will automatically scale our instance based on the settings that we have specified. So let's try and simulate that and see what will happen in those cases. So let's come back to the function.cs and let's spend more time doing some work inside the function handler. We will simulate this by using thread.sleep. So let's simply specify thread.sleep and let's specify a timeout. Now this is in milliseconds. So let's give this a five seconds wait. So let's specify into five. This will wait for five seconds before returning the output. So let's deploy this again. So let's right click and specify publish to AWS Lambda and let's click upload. Now, every time we are going to invoke this function, it's going to wait for five seconds. So let's click invoke and this is going to wait five seconds before giving back the response. Now you can see this has reset back to Visual Studio 1. Now, if I make another call, it is going to return back Visual Studio 2. Now, I cannot consecutively make requests from Visual Studio alone. So let's also use the AWS console to make another request. So let's open the console and let's keep this on one side and keep the Visual Studio instance on the other. So let's split the screen into two and let's make the calls. So let's collapse this. Let's navigate to the test under the Lambda lifecycle where we can test this function. So let's specify the input just like we did in Visual Studio. So let's specify AWS console and let's click the test button. Now this is going to call the same Lambda function from the AWS console. So let's click test and this is successfully returned back. So if you expand the details, you can see this has returned AWS console three, which is as expected because the count was two right when we executed the Visual Studio two. Now let's invoke both of them at the same time. So let's click test and invoke on Visual Studio. Now this is going to create two instances of Lambda because one of the instances is busy serving the AWS console one so the Visual Studio needs a new instance. Now in this case, you can see the Visual Studio count has reset to one. Now if we expand the details, you can see this is returning AWS console four. Now if I invoke this again, one of them is going to get one instance and the other one is going to get the one that we used already. So now this is returning Visual Studio five and this will return two. So you now understand that now there's two instances in AWS Lambda that's serving requests coming from the AWS console and also from Visual Studio. Now, if we were to have more requests, so let's say we're going to also use the AWS command line so we can use the AWS CLI to invoke the Lambda function. So here I have my command prompt open. So let's paste in the command to invoke the Lambda function. So this is using the AWS CLI. It's specifying the Lambda invoke specifies the function name, which is Lambda lifecycle. It's specifying the format, which is raw in and base 64 out, and also specifies the payload, which is console in this case. And it gets the response and just outputs the response onto our command console. So let's execute this to see the response. Now in this case, it's executed and now it's specifying console six. Now, if I make all these requests together, one of them is going to get a new request. So let's execute the CLI. Let's execute the AWS console and also the Visual Studio. Now, in this particular case, Visual Studio has got a new instance. Now, each of these instance is going to get reused after the first call. So you can see the constructor code is not getting invoked after that anymore. So each time Lambda creates a new instance, it initializes and creates an instance of this function class and thereafter it just calls the function handler on that instance. So when writing your function code, it's very important to understand that any code that you write inside your constructor gets invoked only once when the new Lambda instance is created. So if you are depending on properties like this count or other state variables, which you expect to be reset inside your function, that will happen only once for your function instance. Now to avoid these scenarios, it's better to not have any instance variables inside your function handler class. Now, if you want to maintain state, it's best done in an external storage. So let's remove this from here with the count and you can use the count property directly by using it inside your function code. So if I'm using int count is equal to zero, 
it's going to get reset in each of these particular invocation. Now, if you're making any changes to your account, it will get affected only within the space of the function handler. Now, in this case, if we deploy this, each time we're going to invoke the function, it's always going to return one. So let's publish this to Lambda and let's invoke this function. So it's going to wait for five seconds and respond Visual Studio one. Now, if I invoke this once again, since we are resetting the variable inside the function code, it's always going to return us Visual Studio one. Now this is going to remain the same, even if I'm going to invoke it from a different place, let's say the console. So this is also going to return console one, and this is still going to return Visual Studio one. Now this is because every time our function handler is invoked, it's using a variable that's scoped inside the handler. I hope this helps you to understand the AWS Lambda lifecycle and the different phases of Lambda lifecycle. We also saw what happens in each of these phases and how it affects the code that we write inside our function handler. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you want to be notified of future such videos, make sure to hit the subscribe button. It also helps to grow my YouTube channel. Thank you and see you soon.